welcome back. Let's let's in this video play around with some shift bases. Okay, so let's say that I have um, let's say I have this group right here, right? Let's say I have this particular shift base. Let's say I hydrolyze it. Without showing the mechanism, what do I get? What do I get? I want to get something that looks like this, right? Right. What's my what's the my amine that comes off? I just get NH3, and at physiological pH that would just be ammonium, right? So at physiological pH that would pick up a proton, and you just get this, right? Ammonium, right? So what happens if I change the identity of the amine? Right? What happens if I have this? What happens if I have something like this? What happens if I start with that? If I do a shift base hydrolysis, what do I get? Well, I'm just going to end up with a ketone, right? But I end up with something like this. What comes off? You're just going to get this, right? Assuming it's at physiological pH, you just have your R group and three protons, right? I hope that makes sense. So what happens instead? Let's say I have this situation. Let's say I have this, right? Let's say I have this situation. So I have this. And I do a shift base hydrolysis. What do I get? So instead of getting a ketone, I get an aldehyde, right? What comes off? Get R and H3, right? So this was the case that we saw in the catecholamine oxidation, right? So if I started off with this, so draw my catechol ring, right? And I started with this shift base, right? There was epinephrine as a shift base. What happens when I do a shift base hydrolysis? What happens? Well, you have to think about that there's a proton right there, right? So where's the water going to attack? It's going to attack this carbon, right? And initially, that's going to force the lone pair onto this nitrogen, right? So when I do a shift base hydrolysis, what do I get? I do a shift base hydrolysis. This whole rest of the molecule over here remains static, right? But I get an aldehyde. And this proton, this proton right here in purple, that's uh, this proton right here. So when I, when I oxidize epinephrine, what's my leaving group? It's just methylaminium, right? If it was deprotonated, you'd call it methylamine, right? Actually, let me redo that. I didn't mean to put an R group there. I literally meant to put CH3, right? Because we know it's a methyl group in the case of epinephrine, right? So you would call this group methylaminium, right? Or you could equally draw that like this, right? You could say NH3 plus with just the methyl coming off of it, right? So what happens if instead, let's say I start with a different catecholamine. Let's say I start with something that looks like this. Let's say I start with, let's say I start with dopamine. So here's dopamine. If I form the shift base, which again is going to be through FAD, right? We mentioned that in another video. What's my shift base? Well, your shift base formation is going to be virtually identical. So you're going to end up with this. Right. There's your shift base. So what happened, and again, this is FAD dependent, right? This is the enzyme monoamine oxidase. What happens when I hydrolyze it? Well, remember, there's a proton there. So when you hydrolyze this particular shift base, what happens? Again, the catechol ring stays the same, right? But what happens? You just get this, right? Just get an aldehyde. So one of the key features of monoamine oxidase that you get is that monoamine oxidase produces aldehydes. And by the way, what's your leaving group? It's just, just ammonium, right? There's no R group on this amine, so you end up getting ammonium. Let's do one more example. One of the other uh, main neurotransmitters that's done by monoamine oxidase. So let's say instead of starting with dopamine, 
I instead start with norepinephrine. What does norepinephrine look like? It's almost the same as dopamine, except you have you have a hydroxyl group at the beta position. It's added by dopamine beta hydroxylase. So this is your amine, right? What happens if I do shift base hydrolysis? What do I get? Again, catechol ring stays the same, right? What do I get? Aldehyde, right? What's my leaving group? Again, it's just ammonia, right? So one of, the, again, the key feature of monoamine oxidase is it produces aldehydes, right? You have to imagine that right here, there's a proton, right? And that proton is conserved throughout this mechanism at that point, okay? So the way you analyze what monoamine oxidase does is if we come up here, right? Okay, so if I draw a generic catecholamine, okay? And I'm going to draw it essentially in... I'm going to draw it in the imine state, right? Okay. Essentially, what you do is you say, okay, well, there's a there's a hydrogen here. We're assuming it's in the protonated state, and there's some R group. Okay. So what you do when you're analyzing what monoamine oxidase does, basically you disregard you disregard everything over here. Okay. Disregard all this business over here because that part's going to remain static, right? And all you do is this bond right here, you insert a carbonyl, right? So effectively what you get, again, your catechol ring stays the same, right? All this business, the beta carbon stays the same. You just replace this with an aldehyde, right? So monoamine oxidase is assuming that you didn't, um, you know, synthetically modify this proton, um, you're going to have a hydrogen here. Now, you could potentially um, put something synthetic here, and if it reacted with monoamine oxidase, whatever's purple there would remain the same, right? Unless it's some kind of suicide inhibitor, right? And then what you do is you say, okay, I'm looking here at my R group, and then the amine that gets spit off, right, is going to contain that R group. It's going to contain this proton, right? So let me do it in a different color. This proton right here is going to be right here. And then as it leaves, it's just going to pick up two extra protons. Right? And so what, at physiological pH, this amine is going to exist as a positive charge. So we would call it an aminium, right? Aminium, right? So it's an aminium. And depending on what the R group is, that dictates you know, what you would name it. If, if, if you're dealing with epinephrine, the R group is a methyl group, so you just call it methylamine, okay? In the case of dopamine and norepinephrine, which are the main ones that get catabolized by this enzyme, you just get ammonium, right? Now, one thing interesting about monoamine oxidase is whenever we use, ep when we catabolize epinephrine, what do we end up getting? When we catabolize epinephrine, we end up getting this. All right, we get methylamine. Well, it turns out that you can actually catabolize that further, okay? So we have this carbon here, right? And actually, the, the catabolism of methylamine is done through the exact same mechanism as monoamine oxidase. In fact, the mechanism is virtually identical. It's a flavoprotein, so we end up forming a shift base, right? Shift base, so here's your CH2, right? Form a shift base. This has a positive charge, right? What happens now? What do you think? Shift base hydrolysis, right? Where does water attack? Attacks right there at the carbon, right? So if I sh if I hydrolyze this, what do I get? What's my leaving group? It's ammonium, right? Ammonium's my leaving group. Um, what is the carbon containing group? Well, my two R groups are what? They're protons, right? What did you always get when you did a shift base hydrolysis? Got a carbonyl. So when you fully catabolize epinephrine, you end up generating formaldehyde. Okay. And the catabolism of epinephrine, once you generate the, the methylamine, you catabolize that even further down to ammonium and formaldehyde. So 
formaldehyde will get catabolized even further. We'll go into that in a later video. But suffice it to say for now, it's just important that you understand shift-based chemistry and sort of how to predict the products. Okay? Again, the hydrolysis mechanisms are exactly the same throughout every single enzyme. Um, pretty soon we'll go into the mechanism of aldolase. So I hope this video helps. See you in the next video.